You know, when Darwin wrote his great tracts on evolutionary theory, he stressed two elements of the selection process. Natural selection, fair enough, and certainly there's sexual selection. Now, it's a scandal in scientific history, as far as I'm concerned, that for almost 100 years after Darwin published his great works on sexual selection, biologists tended to pretty much ignore it. It's like, yeah, no, natural selection. And that was because I think it was easier to maintain a strict determinism by concentrating on natural selection. The tricky thing about sexual selection is, how is that not conscious choice? I mean, what, you don't make a conscious choice when you select? Well, maybe you don't if you've had enough alcohol. I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, recommend that as a long-term mating strategy, but you tell me that the conscious choice of women specifically is more complex in the case of men, because we're an easier. We don't have as much at stake, and so we're not as choosy. Women are exceptionally choosy. And certainly, it's like a truism among evolutionary biologists that part of the reason that we had such rapid cortical expansion is because of sexual selection. It's like, how is that not the action of consciousness on matter? And you might say, well, that's only been operating since Homo sapiens because nothing was conscious before then. It's like, you ever see that BBC clip of the pufferfish making the Mandela? Oh, well, you could look that up. This little pufferfish, he's like this long. He's just a pufferfish, you know. <laughs> it doesn't have any hands, which is kind of hard if you... Hard problem if you want to be a sculptor. He makes this sculpture that's like 20 feet across. He's this big, 20 feet across at the bottom of the ocean. And it's a perfect circle and quite complexly undulated and wavy. It's not the sort of Mandela you would see in a great cathedral, but he's just a fish, man. It's not so bad, you know? And he spends like a week building this thing. And it's so funny watching him in the film because he, he goes down there and he like maybe there's a stray piece of shell and he grabs that and he spits it out because no shells in the damn sculpture. It has to be clean. And then he, he pops up and he turns one eye like a bird and he looks at it and then he goes down and waves a little sand into place. He's making these dunes that are like a foot high and there's like 400 of them. And then you see an aerial shot of it. It's this, really, it's the size of this stage. And then this female puffer fish comes along and, you know, checks it out and sees if he's got what it takes. And... If he does, away they go. It's like, it isn't obvious to me at all that that puffer fish isn't conscious. And I would say, say, well, you're anthropomorphizing. It's like, okay, let's have that discussion. So I'm pretty familiar with the animal experimental literature. And the greatest animal experimentalists, especially those that study motivation and emotion, so they're the ones that are delving very deep into the neurophysiological apparatus, their basically rule of thumb is, you anthropomorphize except when there's a reason not to. It's like, rats, they're pretty complicated. They play, they laugh, you can tickle them. They die without love, you know? Pufferfish, they make sculptures. Here's a story about spiders. This is a fun story, if you like stories about spiders. So there's these spiders and the female won't mate with the male unless the male offers her a gift. And so he has to find some dead fly or something that's particularly delicious to a female and then wrap it really nicely in a web and present it to her. And if she likes it and it's a good fly, then maybe she'll deign to mate with them. But the damn spiders, it's so funny. Some of them will wrap up dirt <laughs> and present that. It's like they tend not to get away with it, you know, but sometimes they do, so that's pretty funny. But what's also funny is sometimes the female will eat the fly and leave the guy, <laughs> you know, in his, in, his, in his agitated state, let's say. Like... Franz de Waal, who's a great primatologist, just wrote a book called Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? And the answer to that could well be no. I mean, octopuses, for example. Man, those things are smart. And they can do all sorts of things we can't do. You know, they can transform the texture of their surface as well as the color to match an underlying rock. It's like they'll clamp onto a rock and then poof, they're exactly like the rock. It's like, that's hard. And it's hard to imagine how something like that is possible even without the intermediation of something like consciousness. And I cannot see at all how you can be a biologist and believe in sexual selection and think that only random factors determine evolution. It's like, what about mate choice? Well, yeah, no, 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 really. What about mate choice? Really? And you might say, well, that's not aiming at some determinate end and that's complicated. And that's worthy of discussion, but it's not obvious to me at all that in the human case, it's not aiming at some idealized end. 
I mean, we certainly look for something approximating an ideal in a mate. We want that, and we want to encourage it if we don't have it to begin with, unless we're, you know, bitter and resentful and jealous. And so we are pushing towards an ideal that's at least implicit, and it governs us at every level of our social interactions.